Yeah, so while Maithili is gone, I'm just going to use this time to introduce her to all of you. Maithili Prakash, based in Los Angeles, was gone now, is looking for her AirPods now, is a second generation Indian and American Bharatanatyam dancer who has positioned herself as a global and cosmopolitan artist through her unique experiences and collaborations. Her repertoire is an embodiment of narratives of the many worlds that shape her. Maithili grew up in an environment filled with dance and music. Uh, under the watchful eye of her mother uh, uh, and teacher, dance exponent Vijay Prakash, she began her performing career with her solo debut in India at the age of eight and has since performed extensively in prestigious venues and festivals across the world. Um, she studied with several legendary stalwarts from India and is currently under the tutelage of India's acclaimed Bharatanatyam artist uh, Malavika Sarukai. Mal uh, Maithili has stored her solo productions in the United Kingdom, Scotland, France, and Singapore, United States, Mexico. She was featured on NBC's Superstars of Dance as a Bharatanatyam soloist. Maithili also had the honor of um, working with director Ang Lee in the award-winning film Life of Pi and was cast as the wife of Pi, uh, for those who recall. <laughs> Uh, nominated by celebrated uh, dancer choreographer Akram Khan as choreographer of the future for UK-based dance umbrellas 4x4 commissions, Maithili premiered her work here and now at uh, their 2019 festival. She's currently touring in Akram Khan's company, um, Akram Khan Company's production, Outwitting the Devil. Uh, Maithili, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Akila. Right. Uh, I must say that, uh, you know, there are some artists that I've had the opportunity of uh, interviewing over and over again. And I'm always amazed at how uh, each time, uh, you know, they allow me the opportunity of being able to write a new story. And I definitely think that you're one of those um, artists who's always like, uh, you know, I've in interviewed you, I think, from 2007 so or times. 8, I think, so many yeah. times across different publications. And I've always enjoyed our interactions. I've always been amazed at how you have different things to say each time and, uh, you know, help me, like, write a better story each time. So, um, well, Akila, a lot, of that year, comes, a lot of that comes from you. You always, like, oh. know, you know, you always have the right questions to ask. So that makes a difference. Thank you, Maithili. But last year, um, I had the opportunity of interviewing her for another magazine. And she had just returned at that point from Australia after uh, being away from family and her uh, uh, four-year-old daughter, Rumi. After about 45 days, she was reunited with her family when I interviewed her. And I remember we talked about how tough it must have been for her to take that decision to set aside almost a year to be part of Outwitting the Devil. And uh, Maithali spoke about how motherhood is really an amazing gift. But she also talked about how often she felt conflicted about not being able to spend enough time equally with both her babies, that is Rumi, and with dance. But she also talked to me about how dance, in a sense, is her first love. And how being a part of Outreaching the Devil and setting aside a year almost gave her the time, the opportunity to spend quality time with her dance. So we're going to be talking about all of that. But the focus of our discussion today, as the topic of the conversation is called, is thinking body, dancing mind. This morning when I was out for a run, I was thinking about uh, this idea in the context that I come from. And I was thinking that as a journalist, um, you know, a, a, you know, and a writer, ideas often form, take shape, find flow and movement first in our heads, mm -hmm. in the mind, before mm -hmm. they actually find expression in print. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I'm, I've almost written the story in my head and yeah. then I kind of like write it on my laptop. Yeah. So I thought about how this idea is applicable to the context of dance per se. In a sense, do ideas first begin dancing in your mind? And then do they sort of translate into the body? So I'd like to sort of set, uh, you know, start off by asking you to, you know, talk about this. And then I have a series of questions for you, Maitli. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like everything starts with the mind. You know, we talk so much about physicality when it comes to dancing. But I would say the physicality is actually probably 10%. And so much of the rest of the process is emotional, mental, psychological. And I think what you touched upon is this idea of creativity, right? The creation mm -hmm. that starts in the mind. And that's definitely, yeah. that's one aspect of it, I feel like. But what I thought, like, I thought an interesting starting point would be 
you called it, I don't know if it's the title or you, you spoke about it when we chatted, but you said the yeah. mind of the body, right? And, yeah. and I actually, I feel like I, I've never actually thought of it that way. You know, I've never thought of the body as having a different mind from the mind. But then yeah. after you said that, I was like, that makes perfect sense, you know, because I think we have, is my sound better now? This is much better. This is good. Okay. So, so actually, like, we usually think about body and mind, right? And we speak about body-mind alignment. Yeah. But the more I thought about it, I realized there's a third character. So there is our mind as a dancer. The mind just wants yeah. to dance. And then there's the body, which comes with its weaknesses and, you know, my flexibility or my, you know, the kind of range of movement that my body naturally has. Yeah. And I can fuel it through what I eat and how much rest I get and how much I exercise and how much I train. But then there's the body, there's the mind of the body. And that feels like it's something different. It's temperamental. It's like it has its own moods every day. You know, it's, it's not something that um, is the same. And, and it's not something that can be controlled. I feel like it's like a child. You know, you have to, you can't tell it what to do. You have to kind of cajole it and, um, you know, make it want to listen to you. And it's not, it's a moving target. So it's not something that once you've got it, you've got it. You know, it's like you have to constantly exactly. work towards it. And, um, right. and so when we talk about alignment, we're not just talking about body and mind alignment. We're talking about body, mind, and the body's mind alignment, you know? Yeah. And, like, yeah. and, and when we get that alignment, then we feel like we're in flow. There's, like, there's some ease, and there's, um, yeah. then we feel like we're dancing, you know? And there's a certain high that we get off of that. And, and yeah. that's not even it. It's like when we're in that alignment, then we're open to the otherness and the moments of magic and the moments of transcendence that we often talk about as artists. Right. Um, so it's just, it's so important to first have that alignment and then. Right. Know. Yeah. In fact, my next question, Michael, was really uh, that, do you agree and believe that the body actually has a mind of its own? And I was, you know, uh, there are some days when uh, the mind are in, and body, and I'm talking about <laughs> the mind of the body, they're in conflict. Yeah. Right? Okay, and days yeah. when they're totally in sync, right? In flow, yeah, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. What happens when what happens when they're rebelling and conflicting with each other? Uh, and what happens when they're, you know, in sync and they're like kind of flowing? Ah, Maitri, why are you moving? Sorry, give me one second. I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry, sure, I need sure. my charger. I'm so sorry. I did not no anticipate problem. that I'd be logging in on my phone. My phone is always dying. Sorry, Akila, can you just repeat what you just said? Akila, can you repeat your question? Okay, no problem. So, in fact, when you talk to me about, uh, you know, you said the, the, the mind of the body, right? My question was mm -hmm. really like, do you agree and believe that the body has a mind of its own? And there are some days when the mind and body are in conflict, right? And there's yeah, some days yeah. when they're completely in sync with each other, like they're yes. flowing together, right? Yes. What happens in, in cases when they're conflicting with each other? And what happens on those days when they're in absolute like alignment? So I think that, um, I think when they're in absolute alignment, then you're set, you know, then that day is an amazing practice. You feel wonderful. And yeah. to be honest, it's not even that that lasts the whole time. You know, so when I said a moving target, it really is moving yeah. all the time. But yeah. I think that when they are not in alignment, I think that's when we struggle as, as artists mm -hmm. and we feel frustrated and we feel like um, we feel like dancing is hard, you know. And I think that that's um, it's Aditya is messaging me. <laughs> um, I think that it's. I think we need to learn how to be able to use the psychological component of our, um, right. of our mind to get our body in order to listen. And so for me, a lot of that has been creating a practice, creating a training, um, like a ritual, a training routine. ritual. Routine. Yeah, a routine that allows me to get into that state of, of mind. Because, you know, when we have a show, the, everything that day is geared towards... Um, performing you know and we um we we wake up in the morning and we know that we have a show that night we've set aside whatever work yeah. we have our family kind of leaves us alone to some extent 
Um, right. And everything we do, we don't go to a party in the morning. You know, we, we, our mind is completely focused on what we have coming yeah. up that evening. Yeah. And I think when we practice, we don't have that. We don't have that. You know, we, we just come into the space and then we're like, okay, I have to get the, the job done. And especially when we have other things, right. when we have family, we have one and a half, two hours in the studio and we have to just right. practice. And so how do we prevent yeah. it from being mechanical or how do we prevent it from being a practice that is not in alignment? And so for me, that's what I've been working on is this idea of creating a ritual that allows me to get into that mental space of practice so that when I'm in mm -hmm. the studio, I'm, I'm like more prone to getting that yeah. alignment. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, it's just been simple. Um, it starts with the simple process of walking because I know that I can walk. It's not hard to walk, you know. Yeah. And so and then it moves into things that my body feels good doing and my body enjoys doing. And so through that, and then by keeping the same thing every day, um, I have, once I've entered that ritual, then my body knows how to navigate it. And my, more than my body, my mind knows how to navigate it. It, know, it knows what's coming okay. next. And if there is kind of any discrepancy, I fall back on the fact that I do this. I, I know I do it and I just have to do it without thinking. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like, a, like from what you're saying, it's like a happy marriage sort of thing. You, you have like more uh, days with alignment rather than like days where the mind and body are rebelling. You're because asking me if I have that? Sort of I think so. This is yeah. only, this is something that I've really actively been doing for the last two and a half months. And yes, it's like, um, yeah, I've been feeling that way. There are, there are obviously days that are much harder. And but on those days, I know that I just have to push it. And I think that's right. something that's that's important. Um, I have I've been having this conversation a lot with friends who are dancers and with students of dance, because a lot of times we tend to push it off or we tend to because what I said earlier, it's hard, right? It's so much easier to get on a bike and do a workout or do do a yoga class where somebody's telling you what to do. But to come yeah. on your own into the space and practice the way you want to practice no. is really really tough yeah and so yeah, i think that absolutely. and so part of it is just you just do it you know and that's that a lot of times we procrastinate oh i haven't eaten enough oh i'm not i'm not stretched enough oh right. should i do this later you know maybe my kid needs me now but i think that when you just have that and you said this is what i have to do and i just have to do it then you do it and once you're doing it you feel even even though it's hard some days are harder once you're doing it you feel the that joy of doing it, yeah. you know? Because it's almost being sacrosanct about that ritual, right? Yeah, 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 totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, um, so Michael, I'm curious about how, like, you know, how do you fuel the body and how, you, how do you fuel the mind? And are these, uh, are there like different strategies and processes you imply, employ to kind of sort of, you know, keep um, each of these ship shape, like, I mean, you know, does the body need a different kind of, fueling and does the mind need a different kind of stimulus so i think um i mean fueling the body is like you know you need to eat right you need to sleep well you need to train for me it's like it's also i like to cross train so i do yoga i do i mean i have physio now because i've had this injury and so now i've learned yeah. the importance of rehab and then right. um and then i you know i what did i say i i, I have ver various physical fitness training um, right. methods and then I also have my practice and um, and so I think that's you know when we talk about physicality that's that but when we talk about training the mind I think um, a lot of it is what we is what we just spoke about is creating that ritual for oneself right and having right. that be something that one can inhabit for me it's also about like I'm really inspired by Kobe Bryant um, you know, he's, he's, I mean, most people know Kobe yeah. Bryant, <laughs> um, but he speaks about something called Mamba mentality. And, um, and like that, okay, if you don't know what that is, it's um, the Mamba is a venomous snake. And so he gave his mind this, um, this thing called, uh, he gave his state of mind um, a name called Mamba mentality, which is the mentality that's going to kill and it's like for him, it, it, it speaks about competitive edge. It speaks of being in the zone and be so, being so finely focused on what you're yeah. going to do on the game or whatever, right? And so for me, I feel like that, that inspires me and that drives me, that idea of have, entering that mental zone, entering that state of mind. And so 
I, I think of it as like a mentality as well, right? Like what I just described to you, my ritual, it allows me to enter. I don't have a name for it yet. And I can't use Mamba because that's Kobe's name. Yeah. But like, but it's just that idea of being single pointedly focused in that moment and in and creating a process that allows you to enter that. I think that's how you can um, psychologically train your mind. Right. right. Yeah. But, but tuning out of like the external kind of noise and yeah. tuning in. Surely yeah. can't be easy, right? Maitli, I know that you have a small child. I mean, it's like, yeah. it's tough, right? Yeah. So how do you, like, even though I know that you're, you know, sacrosanct about this ritual and then you have yeah. this practice, how do you kind of tune out to tune in? I mean, I, I feel like that's where I'm just saying, you just do it. <laughs> like, I think part of it is designing the process, right? Like, I think what, what, what is difficult for us as classical soloists is we don't have the infrastructure. I think when you when you're I mean obviously Kobe Bryant's different but when you're even an athlete or a member of a company you have people who are setting the schedule for you yeah. right they're telling you what to eat they're telling you how to train how to warm up how you need to stretch your body how you what drills you need to do in order to maximize you know right. your efficiency yeah. at the game how you need to like what kind of massage you need what kind of physio you need all of that is given to you in some measure and you just have to carry it out right? right and for us what's difficult is we have to assimilate all the information like for each bharatanatyam dancer our body is different i mean naturally but also the way we dance the choreography we do is different and it's very specific to our body right. so we have to essentially design this whole thing of how do i warm up how do i train how what is my practice look like how do i cool down what physio do i need to supplement that and so that's i think where it becomes difficult and we get stuck in this thing of like okay what do i do if somebody is telling me what to do it's easier to just do it right but right. that the right. mental investment of also planning it and carrying it out it's like being self employed too right you're on your own yeah, time yeah. versus my husband who goes to work he has a really hard job but his job is all set for him and he can just do so i think that's yeah. where w- once we need to plan efficiently and then we just have to carry it out and like i told you entering or tuning in i think how you do that is to find simple tasks that allow you to tune in for example i told you i walk if i just came into my studio and i said okay i'm going to do a pushpanjali like my body would be like oh i don't want to do a pushpanjali you know like it just or it would take more unless i come in super charged and i say i want to do a pushpanjali mm-hmm. but if i like for me i start i walk i start walking and it's just a matter of putting one foot in front of the other and just yeah. moving and at that point my mind is turning maybe allowing whatever thoughts that have come in to work themselves out and then consciously letting them go and like entering right. the mental and physical space and then right. moving to something um you know a little more comfortable we sorry alita can you stop texting me please thank you okay <laughs> Yeah, like, like, you know, something that feels good and that... something that feels good, yeah. that's easy yeah. on the body, easy on the mind, that allow, allows you to then develop into your practice ritual. That, yeah. And that so allows like me to like, tune in. Like, yeah, so it's almost like the body is kind of like being like a stimulus for the mind and vice versa in some sense, yeah. right? totally totally yeah. yeah okay that's interesting maybe i'm curious about the idea of of fatigue and of exhaustion and what happens on days when the the mind is like overwhelmed you know with so much going on but the body is raring to go and vice versa and does that happen you know um, because performance like if you if you if you look at a marathon for example mm-hmm. like uh, you know it's about willing the mind also to push the body through or mm-hmm. pushing the body and allowing the mind to sort of carry along so yeah. what happens on on days when one of the two when one of the two is exhausted um that's interesting cuz i think okay let's see when the mind is exhausted and the body is raring to go i feel like that's yeah. so rare well if that happens i feel like then the mind is exhausted meaning the mind doesn't want to think it's feeling full yeah, or overwhelmed just, yeah I mean But that I happens think, to me all the time like I'm yeah. always like yeah that, that's it that's actually a great state of mind to to dance in because I think at that yeah. point you just you have all of this energy that's like you know ready in your body yeah. yeah and so at that moment at those moments I think that that's when you just release it 
you know, and the mind doesn't have to think too much. Um, yeah, I think that that works out well. And I think when it's the opposite, when your mind is full and your body is tired, I think that's when it's more hard. And that's when you have to, when you know, your kind tired, of, yeah. when your yeah. body is tired, because you need the body to, you know, facilitate yeah. whatever you have going on in your mind. Right. Um, so, so Michael, would you think that in some sense for a dancer, uh, you know, the, the body is just such a, like a, like the instrument, right? So it's imperative that the body is always like on top of the game, right? In that sense. Do you feel that sometimes? Um, that it's okay feel that you, mentally you could be jaded, but it's your, you know, but your body has to be like. I don't you know? think so. I think, I think they have to be, like I, I said earlier, I think phys the physicality of it is just 10% of it. I think your mind has to be, you have to be psychologically like, um, in the, yeah, in it. And like, can I share a little bit about kind of my, my yes. growing up? Because yes, I feel please. like there's like this huge history that I have with my, with physicality and emotionality when it comes to stamina and dancing and stuff like that. And it's really changed over the years and it's affected yeah. my relationship with dance. Um, I think like growing up, okay, I'm going to like walk you through the life of my yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, I think because growing up, I grew up around dance, like seeing dance all the time, performed, right. whatever. Right. And I was a kid and I, in my mind, I had this idea of how I wanted to dance and my body couldn't really dance like that. It wasn't trained. It was smaller. You know, I was always watching people older than me. So there was a certain frustration of not being able to have them sing. And then w when I, ha I did my Anangitram, um, it was on my eighth birthday. I was in India and my parents said, what do you want to do for your birthday? And I said, I want to dance. And so um, they, it, they said, okay, my mom said, your, my gurus have never seen you perform. Why don't you perform for them in a temple? So I remember that was the first time I really felt like I had worked and trained and practiced. I remember thinking like, oh, I'm sweating. This is what it feels like to sweat. And when I danced the performance, I felt so free. Like I felt like I was just like flying, you know, and I, I remember feeling that I think probably that alignment that we talk about, right, that yeah. ease and that flow. And that made me feel like, you know what, like, I want to dance all the time. And so I told my mom, I want to be serious about dancing. And the next year I started performing. Um, eight. So eight was when I performed. Yeah, by nine, I was I had had a tour. But I think at that time, also, it's like, oh, a kid is performing, like, you know, everybody wants to see children dance or whatever, you know, so I had a lot of performances lined up. And it, I was very particular that I don't want to be looked at as a kid dancing, I want to be like, seen as a serious dancer, you know, and, and my mom was also like, very particular, if you are going to perform, then you have the responsibility to perform and you have to train. So right. that idea of practice was really instilled in me from the beginning. And I saw the difference when like, for example, the following year, there was a show where I was very tired in one performance. And these were hard. Like, we would dance for two and a half, three hours, right? It would, things yeah. were 90 minutes at that time. And I would always pick the hardest pieces because those were the ones I found the most exciting. And there was a show where I got a little tired. And in the next show, I told my mom, I don't want to feel like this. Like, help me feel not tired, you know? And yeah. so she said, okay, do the whole thing two, two times in a row, back to back. So that was five hours of dancing and I did it. And I was, I mean, I was exhausted. I fainted that day. It was like, whatever. But the next day in the show, I still remember so vividly in Delhi, it was just freedom, complete freedom. Wow. My mind was not thinking like, oh, I'm going to get tired in this jetty or I'm going to feel this in the Tilana. It was just like, I just was having an amazing time. And I remember thinking like this, so practice allows you that freedom like the training of your body allows you that mental yeah. like space you know space. yeah yeah but then like after that things change because again like your body goes through growing right like through my teen my early teens it was like I had growing pains I had tendonitis and I developed a very traumatic relationship with my body because the performance didn't performances didn't stop I still had performances lined up and my mom is very like, you know, if it's not broken, then you got to do it, you know. So I have memories of shows where I'd be crying during intermission or be there was one time I remember crying before the Dilana telling my mom, I can't do it. Like, I cannot perform. I cannot dance. And she was like, music's playing. You got to go, you know. And so it was just like she I mean, in a way, it instilled yeah. in me that grit, you know, like you have to dance like, you know, and, and I know stories. 
yeah, her, my people, you know, all these senior dancers who jumped through fire to continue yeah. their shows, you know? But I think right. for me, it created this, like, the, from, I think, whatever, my teens until even 2000, as early as 2006, or as late as 2006, I always, I would get sick before performances because of this, like, nervousness and this, like, fear, kind of, of feeling tired and feeling exhaustion and right. it, it just became a very kind of psych cyclical, traumatic thing. And right. that even weighed into my decision to become a dancer full time. I was like, how can I sustain a career in dance if I get sick before every show? Yeah. You know, Correct. and um, and there was I think everything changed for me in 2006. I did this circuit, you know, the Natyanjali circuit that you do during yeah. the Shivaratri time. And right. I performed in um, Chidambaram and Tanjavur, like uh, all those temples. Yeah. And I remember feeling like it wasn't, didn't feel like performance. It felt like an offering, you know, because it was. It's like you're dancing in a temple. And I felt different. I was doing pieces that were hard that I usually get so nervous about in shows. But I, right. it wasn't like there wasn't the pressure of like Michael yeah. has to do this performance. There was just this feeling of mm. offering. And, and I yeah. remember doing a show a few weeks after that in Delhi at the Ravi Shankar Center. And, um, and, my, and my dad would always be like, oh, you know, I've invited so-and-so, like this is an important program. And I hated hearing that. I, I don't want to know who's coming. I don't want to know that this is important for my career, whatever, whatever, you know? Right. So I would have to tune that out. And I really thought, how can I recreate that feeling that I had in Chidambaram, in Tanjur, whatever, for Shivratri, how can I create that in performance? Right. And, right. and I, did, I mean, I did that. I remember that evening was just so magical, you know, even though musicians had come in before and it was like stressful, whatever, but in that moment, it was just like, I just felt like how I felt over there. And I felt like that became a thing for me. And yeah. after that, on, to be honest, it changed. Like I, I stopped getting sick before every program because my mentality changed. And the psychology right. behind it wasn't the pressure of performance or the worry about being tired. I mean, obviously, everybody still worries about being tired. Right. But when awesome. the psychology changed, then everything just felt like it opened up. And it, it became wow. like, I felt, I, felt, I felt freedom that I had, yeah. had not felt in a long yeah. time. Yeah, it's interesting you use the word, uh, you know, you said, use the word liberated and you use the word freedom. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, uh, in a sense, when you when your body and mind are in alignment, Maithili, I'm just mm -hmm. like, you talked also about space, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. Do you feel like, um, you know, I, I'm curious about how, like you said that when you dance in alignment, there's also mm -hmm. like so much space. Like, yes. like create. Yeah. Can yes. you just elaborate a little bit on that idea? I think when, when we talk about space, like me mental or emotional space, yeah. it's the lack of um, thinking. Because we tend to, I mean, at least for me, I know that it would be, it would be a lot of, um, God, this is going to seem like I'm really one track, but it's true. Like you think about, okay, at this point I get tired, or at this point this is hard, or at this point this might happen. There's a lot of that kind of yeah. thinking that would Lots, happen. Right? My, yeah. yeah, and when I talk about space, it's... Um, it's immersion. It's like, it's, it's being in the moment. It's being, um, right. being like fully immersed in the content and the, the, what you're actually doing, you know? Doing, yeah, in the now, yeah, right? In the now. And I think like, okay, so this is another thing that I was thinking about is like when you're younger, you just dance, right? There's not, yeah, you're, you're thinking, I, yeah, I mean, I was having these kinds of thoughts, but it was like a, it was not as mindful of dancing. It was just yeah. like, dancing you know but I think once I started training like I, I remember the first person who made me really like think in a in a mindful way not in like a jumbled way was C.V. Chandrasekhar Professor C.V. Chandrasekhar when um, he had cut my mom had invited him to do a workshop and that was the first time I was kind of exposed to his way of it's very detail oriented like every position of the foot every finger like every elbow every line very 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 detail oriented but in that my mind was engaging in a different way and in a way that was fueling my body and the alignment. Does that make sense? So it wasn't like thinking, okay, oh, this wow. is hard or this is going to happen, but it was thinking, yeah. what is it in this moment? What is my body doing in this moment? And that continued with um, when I started training with Bragaka, right. yeah. um, you know, with Abhinaya yeah. and, and the details of dialogue and 
um, character and and body language and things like that that Brigatka introduced me to. And of course, all of this is not to say my mom had not given me any of this training. You know, she's given me 90%. But when it's your teacher and it's your mom, your first, you know, you kind of, what they say to you is like, you know, you take it in one year. <laughs> yeah, you take, take it for granted. But when somebody new says it, you're like, oh, okay. And so even with Malaka, then it was even more magnified, you know, like, what are your, yeah. what are your, how are your feet touching the ground? How do your fingers feel when you hold this cloth? What, it, how, what state of being are you holding? Or, you know, it, everything yeah. became super, super, super um, sensitive. My mind became, has become, I mean, it's okay. still becoming, but sensitized. Yeah. yeah. And so Very that, right. sens yeah. yeah. And so I feel like then, so then that opens up another space. I mean, when your mind is not a, um, fixating on these other things, it's um, allowing space for those inner dialogues yeah. or that, um, yeah, just that presence or that awareness yeah. in the moment. And yeah, I, and I, that's... And, and to be, to take that further now working with Akram, like, I know you'll, you'll probably ask me about outwitting the devil, <laughs> but yeah, just, this yeah, I was going to ask you, go ahead. The process of working with him, like his kind of work is so, um, it's, it's very like intense and it's um, the way, I mean, even just like to put it very simply, just the kind of attack that he gives his body. Um, that's, you know, like kind of the very surface thing, but even the kind of intensity that he expects in the, in the dancing itself. Um, I feel like in Bharatanatyam, because we have like these long shows, we train as like long distance runners, right? Rather yeah. than sprinters. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like what he expects from us is sprinting. You know, there might be moments where you're just completely still. And then in the next moment, it's this high powered sequence and you have to be a hundred percent, you know? And so that, and I've seen the dancers around me, seeing, you know, like Maven very much would train us with that um, hundred percent mentality in everything we do and seeing the dancers around me, Ching Ying, who is one of the, one of um, Akram's senior member dancers and just watching, I remember I had seen her perform in Until the Lions, which is this incredible show of his. And her movement is so intense. Her character is so intense. And I remember asking her, Do you, are you able to give that intensity in every show and every performance? And she told me, yeah. She said, once I, I remember giving like 80% and Akram picked up right away and was like, 100, we need 100, wow. you know? Yeah. And so having experienced now that is another level of pushing, you know? So yeah. it's, it's just like wow. you have to be present, but you also have to make sure that you are just ramping, ramping, ramping. And so now I'm, yeah. I've been trying to apply that to Bharat and Akiyam too, you know, and, to, and it's hard because it's like when yeah. you're dancing for that long, it's hard to sustain. But if that is how we practice, then I think it's, it's yeah. incredible when I, when I am able to do it, I feel the difference. Yeah, Michael, actually one of the questions I had for you much later on, but was about, you know, your body is inherently sort of, you know, trained uh, in Bharat and Akiyam. Mm -hmm. And when you work with uh, Akram Khan company, what, how uh, how did this body have to kind of realign or did it have to at all? I don't know. I'm asking you, what were the shifts you had to make both in terms of your body and the mind of the body and the mind itself? <laughs> um, so one thing was like I was, I, what we were training in was not what I'm trained in. Like we were taking, or we are, I mean, we're still, we are still, but, um, we were taking ballet class, contemporary class. And we even took a few crump classes. And so it was, I was completely out of my comfort zone. Um, yeah. And in, at first it was very exciting. Like I love taking new kinds of classes. Like it's, it's just nice to do something besides yeah. what you're, yeah. what you're what trained you, in. Yeah. But then it's, it's extremely vulnerable too, because it's like, you know, I'm not yeah. trained in that. I've been spent my whole life training in Bharatanatyam and then now I'm in a yeah. professional company and the people around me are great and I'm like You're struggling. Yeah. yeah. And so it was, ah, it, like... it was, it was struggle. I mean, I struggled a lot, you know, and then, and I think also physically, like when you don't know how to do something, you, you try to do it and your body doesn't know how to intelligently do it, you know? So I got a, quite a few injuries from doing things that way. And I didn't have the knowledge to supplement or to like strengthen those parts of the body that needed right. to work in order to do those new things. So it was really a process of, of um, kind of discovering that up until recently, like I had, yeah. I had a shoulder injury because there were certain movements that needed 
like this intensity, you know? And so, and the way I practice is I do things over and over and over and over. And that's also, I mean, it's great, but it's not smart always, you know, this whole like rigor that my yeah, mom kind of true. like yeah. pushed into my body is also, you have to be intelligent, I realized too, you know? So, you know, in addition to doing things over and over, I should have been strengthening those muscles that were getting fatigued or getting overworked and I wasn't doing that and so that's yeah. when that overuse then and then it continued into touring so then that um, right. you know had negative effects but I think being in this space where you're um, it's unfamiliar territory I think it's amazing because it's it makes you feel like you're just like nothing you know and it's it's humbling it's vulnerable and it's like it's exciting because this whole other world opens up, you know? Discovery, and, yeah. Yeah, discovery. And then, yeah. and then there, it's, there's always something you can take back. Like, for example, what I told you about the idea of commitment. Like, Maven yeah. and Akram always spoke, speak about commitment. And I'd always be like, of course, commitment. Like, we're all devoting our lives to this, you know? But it's not. Commitment it speaks of that intensity in the moment, you know? It's like mama mentality and, like, pu you know, putting that into the into the work, into the choreography, even if you're just standing, like how present are you when you're just standing? Are you just standing or is it like, are you fully there when you're standing? You know, all these things are just, um, I mean, it's been part of my training, but it just really kind of like um, cemented, I guess. Through right. this process. Do you feel that the way you're uh, training in Bharatanatyam now is a little different, um, Michael, is there a little more like awareness, therefore, based on yeah. the time that you've spent with? Totally, Akhanda? totally. Okay. Yeah, so, like my, the, my approach to practice is different, the way I spend my time, the way I, what I invest into my practice is definitely changing. Yes, okay, super. Yeah. Michael, I was going to ask you one question, you know, before I maybe ask uh, people to ask a few questions, is, you know, the, the body often like, like ages with time. Right, mm -hmm. but we, we the mind is like evolving and it's probably like maturing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the mind still has the possibility of of staying young, of mm -hmm. being uh, fresh and contemporary. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm really curious about uh, you know how do you kind of um, you know this sort of uh, the body is aging, but the mind is still sort of young and fresh and. Uh, you know, what is this? Are they interconnected? And how do you kind of keep that connection going when one is probably, um, you know, sort of finding it resisting, like, you know, yeah. with age? I mean, there's some issues, injuries, whatever come in the way. But the mind yeah. is still like intense and it wants to kind of, you know, yeah. how could you talk about that? I feel like you're asking me too early. I'm not, I hope I'm not there yet. Um, no, no, not at all. <laughs> um, but I do feel, I mean, I do, like, technically, I'm young, right? I'm a young Bharatanatyam dancer. Yeah. But it's interesting because in the Outwitting the Devil group, I'm like the second oldest. Because contemporary dancers, like, yeah. you know, retire earlier when we're just right. getting started, you know? So I never thought of myself as old. But I saw that even the way I recovered from an injury was much, it took much longer than somebody who was 10 years younger than me who had an injury at the same time. Yeah. Um, but I think what's really beautiful about our classical arts is that there's different times for different things. Like when you're young, there is space for virtuosity, for like that fire, for that um, like you know, fireworks, I guess, yeah. you know? Yeah, and even, yeah. and I, I mean, I hope I'm still in a place for that. But even for me, like, the desire that I had for fireworks at one point quietened. Like I wanted, I went, I then felt a shift in myself where I wanted to move to stillness. I wanted to move to um, yeah. the more meditative qualities, you know, and it happened to coincide when things came into my life also at that time that were drawing me towards those things. But, um, but it's also like, I see how, you know, we, ha we have this idea of, I mean, you know, we have, we have Abhinaya in classical dance, right? And Abhinaya yeah. is, is fueled and it ripens through life experience, through just like, yeah, yeah just yeah. taking in life, yeah. you know? So I think yeah. we can take yeah. comfort in the fact that even though the body will age and the body will not be yeah. as, yeah. you know, agile and supple, then the mind mm -hmm. will continue to deepen. And even the interaction with the body, like it, even though it might not have, the body takes longer to heal or, you know, it might not be able right. to do all right. the, 
interesting things it could before. Yeah. I think that that wisdom, that alignment between you know the body mind and the body's mind, it it yeah. has that experience of learning how to align. And like you know, even though it's a moving target, I think it'll learn. I mean, it has that wis. It gains more and more wisdom of you know yeah. how to how to find that alignment and then how to dig deep and find depth. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's something that classical dancers can take comfort in is that as we age, we won't be losing, we'll be gaining. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting insight. You know, I was just curious to kind of understand how that works. Um, mm -hmm. Michael, I was just going to ask you about here and now. You kind of uh, worked on it and presented it while you were uh, touring Out to the Devil, right? While yeah, you were still on yeah. tour. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about how you kind of, you know, you had that going on one side and you're talking about so much intensity and then you yeah. still like, you know, kind of managed to think, think about choreograph here and now and actually like, you know, go yeah. through that journey and yeah. sort of, you know, uh, something that was very, very essentially Bharatanatyam. So how yeah. are you making those shifts really so seamlessly? Um, I feel that it wasn't seamless at all. <laughs> Um, it was hard. Like I'm not the kind of person that can work on two projects at once. Um, okay, you're like, not. Okay. When I, yeah, when I'm in something, I have to like my mind is always kind of churning on that. And so for me, um, when we were working on outwitting the devil, when we were in the creation process, I was not thinking about here and now. Like it was the farthest from my mind. Okay. But luckily, I had had the whole year before to just devote to here and now. You know, so there it was. There was something already there. Um, but then having gone through the process of outwitting the devil, I had learned so much and so much had changed that then when I, we had like three weeks in between touring where I was like, okay, I'm going to spend this time on here. And now everything had changed for me. I was like, I want to do this differently. This, you know, the way I looked at the piece was completely different having gone through what I had gone through with the creation yeah, process. Exactly, yeah. And so it was a lot of, um, it was hard because it was like a lot of then suddenly trying to use three weeks to like have a beat it up creation process for myself, you know? Right. And, but then, I mean, it was fine. Like something came out of it, but then the process of then in the weeks leading up to the show, we were touring Outwitting the Devil and then I was working. So it would, it would be, I'd work in the mornings on here and now, and then in the evenings I'd perform Outwitting the Devil. And it was really yeah. like, I, I felt like at that time it was, it was a very, here and now is about the struggle to be in the present. And so this was right. like really a lesson in being in the present because exactly. in the mornings yeah. I'd be creating and thinking of this one piece and in the evenings I'd have to shut that out and perform something completely different. Yeah. Um, wow. So it was, it was, it was very, it was satisfying though. I just, it was funny because we were in Paris for almost two weeks and I didn't see any of Paris because I spent my whole time working in the morning, you know, and right now, but, but on the other hand, it was so satisfying because I was getting that balance of creativity and then also getting to perform, you know, right. in the evening. Yeah. And I think, and I think what's so beautiful about performing is that, like we talked about earlier, you're, you're given that space to just zone in, you know, like you just can put everything else aside and all that matters in that moment is the performance. Yeah, yeah. And so even though it's tiring, being able to do that every night was. No. Really yeah. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Like but now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I just, go it's ahead. just funny because now coming back to look at here and now I'm like, uh, like, I want to work more, you know, because it's yeah. like everything was so quickly happening then. And then I, I, would, I think with anything, when you have space to then look back, then you're like, oh, OK, this worked. But then I want to kind of re redo so much. Right, right. Uh, Michael, I just had one last question. You know, um, uh, when you kind of you talked about your ritual and then mm -hmm. you probably go into your dance studio and then kind of, you know, this is a ritual you kind of follow. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, like, I notice with myself that um, mm -hmm. I might, like, be working or I might mm -hmm. write a story or something. And then what happens is, e even though I might physically actually shut out from that work, my mm -hmm. mind's, like, constantly, in some sense, thinking about, like, what I have to do. And I don't mean yeah. task list. I'm saying thinking about a story or thinking about work in that yeah. sense. Yeah. And, then, like, the, the file cabinet of our minds, where yeah. constantly the mind is never actually... Uh, tuning out so to speak like yeah. when you enter a dance studio your mind and body are in alignment but once yeah. you step out of the studio there's no way for you to actually you know you can stop dancing physically but you yeah. cannot like stop dancing in the mind totally right? uh, yes. but but i'm but i'm curious about why do you think that sometimes it's also important to kind of 
still that mind because yeah. you know i remember having this conversation with alad melwali and she spoke so beautifully about the importance of like like blank nothingness mm-hmm. to kind of you know dream and imagine mm-hmm. and all of that and not do mm-hmm. something not to, and do nothing at all sometimes you know yeah. i think maybe yeah. also made a reference to that so yeah. i i'm curious about how you stop your mind from dancing even though sometimes you may not be actually physically dancing it's really really hard like that is one thing i for sure have trouble shutting off and sometimes it feel bad for yeah. me because i take it into my time with her yeah. you know and that's yeah. that's where i think a lot of our guilt probably comes from yeah um, and you know one thing cuz at night if if something is on my mind i can't sleep like it's just you know like you we have choreography yeah, or something creative yeah, yeah constant so one thing one other ritual i've created is watching tv at night like i just have to after after dinner after rumi goes to bed like i have to do something that's not dance related you know so i yeah, watch right. i watch tv and to me that's like yeah. that's part of my shutting off. I of course I meditate in first thing in the morning and and last thing before going to bed. But even that like you you know stuff finds its way into your meditation and that's not easy but right. I find while watching TV is like my mind will okay. switch off that and it zeroes into something else but at least it's like yeah kind of and 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 bit. one needs to do that right mightly I mean like it's important to kind of I think so. I think so. even just yeah. like time with friends you know like you need to chill out like i remember this one girl um <laughs> this one young dancer asked me when we were in chennai once like a while ago she was like you know i'm i want to take up dance full time and i'm like giving this up and giving that up and like how did what did you do in college you must have been practicing all the time blah 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 and i was like no <laughs> <laughs> i mean i had fun i like enjoy you know like you have to also take breaks chill out do other things because it's like you need to be refreshed also you'll you kind of like i find that i burn out too if i'm just constantly like yeah burn out you know? that's the other thing yeah. right i mean do you have yeah. like rest days do you have like rest and recovery days at all like because rest yeah. and recovery are crucial right totally yeah i take one day off for sure um i take some t- some days i take two days off of dan- of dance practice but i'll continue my workout schedule but then one day for sure i don't do anything right i mean i don't I'm do it so that's rumi's day <laughs> yeah lovely Mike yeah. what is what is uh, you know talk to us about uh, you know uh, what is what have been the key takeaways for you from the lockdown like what um, is the pandemic we've talked to there's so much happened right during the so pandemic much. i mean black lives matter like so much has yeah. happened so much, yeah it's just yeah. been crazy actually it's not yeah. just the pandemic the pandemic has sort of unfolded a, a series of pandemics actually yes. so to speak so yes. um as a dancer um and uh, as somebody who lives in the us like how are you responding to these things and uh, what have been your key takeaways from the lockdown itself i feel like there there have been so many phases through the lockdown like in the first mm-hmm. like yeah so many learning lessons the first part of lockdown i i realized how important like i realized the value of the body because i couldn't dance i had this injury i couldn't work out it yeah. was like things It's like putting my hair up yeah. where yeah it was just and i and i felt so upset you know like just very very demoralized yeah. to not be not be able to dance and so sure. i learned the value of rest i learned the value of physio yeah. and um and i saw how my body is stronger now having like taken that time yeah. um yeah. and then i feel like the, it's so funny i see it i see my lockdown in phases and i also enjoyed and learned to kind of enjoy things like taking walks with rumi being outside like just simple pleasures that we never make the time for you, you know you never get the chance yeah. yeah and so that was kind of phase 1 phase 2 was i i thought of it as building my system it's when i started like i felt like okay my body's ready to dance and i created this ritual and i started like you know taking advantage of this time where there aren't performances and you can just really focus on process and like relishing that and i've i've been reworking um this show jwala that i presented a right. lot before right. and now it's it's going to be um presented through akram khan company and be touring under that um banner so it was supposed to be presented in october um and oh. so i i anyways had like a date you know so i was like yeah. i wanted to rework it and now it's just given me time and it's it's interested it's interesting to see how my personal like just time together with my family with my brother with my mom with Kiran Rumi yep. like so many things have come out that would not have come if we had not had this time together 
and like you know the way we deal with our emotions with our history together with the loss of my dad you know just so many moments that we really haven't had the time to really like miss, acknowledge miss yeah, yeah. We, our lives just continued you know and we didn't really take the time to be with each other and you know and so that's actually really fed my choreography because it's like that wow. piece is so much about processing the loss of my dad and the birth of my daughter so that feels very meaningful um and yeah. then these last few months with the black lives matter movement it's been like a huge wake up call to me in in so many ways just kind of understanding how thinking that something is not a big or thinking not not that it's not a big deal of course we know racism has always been a problem but to think that we don't feed it or that we're not a part of it you know and especially as south asians we benefit so much from this implicit bias and so this whole process of re-educating myself of learning the hi- problematic history that we have with racism right. and for me the even bigger shocker was was looking at the history of bharatanatyam because i've always like i know what's existed but i've never actually been interested in really learning about it yeah. you know yeah. and i've always been yeah. like okay like that's that you know and and like of course i feel for that but i'm like okay but i'm a dancer now and this is my focus has always been all these things we've talked about over this hour and choreography yeah. and it's always yeah. so but then as yeah. a custodian i mean i've been reading so much and we talk about like custodians of art and that's what we are yeah. too as practitioners right and Absolutely. so it can't be like i'm just disconnected like okay my dance form has a history and i'm doing my own thing now and so for me it's been this feeling like um it's like a parent you know like you feel like they're yours like right your mom like it's like your mom yeah. you have your relationship with her um she loves you more than anything you love her more than anything but then to realize that she has this entire past that has so much that has gone into making her who she is like the person that you yeah. know now is because of everything that shaped her you know and so yeah. acknowledging that and finding like ways to do to research and to find out what this is and there's so many it's right. so complicated right like the history of mm-hmm. bharatanatyam is so tied into colonialism to like patri- i mean like i can't even i'm not going to start on that but it's yeah, so tied yeah. into so many things that i feel like um it's been just this process of like it's just a process that started of really educating yeah. myself on that and it's not something we learn i've been teaching a lot this month too and with the kind of more advanced students trying to like initiate discussions just to make them interested in the history because we didn't really talk much about the history of Bharatanatyam yeah like when i was learning when, and there were academics yeah. who would talk about stuff but then they're always so yeah. academic you know and so that um yeah that's for me that's been a really big part especially in yeah. the recent times um maitri there was just one question that somebody had asked it was i don't know she was making a point i think universe is dancing for us then why should we dance we are not separate from the universe okay that's fine okay that's okay so all right mightly so i think i'll um, i just had one last question for you before i um uh you know when you, you you're also a teacher right yes. so how do you kind of help your students understand and appreciate this whole uh this how the the interconnectedness of the mind and the body you know what would you have to say for to young dancers who are probably you know especially in the now everybody sort of you know there's so much going on and mm-hmm. everyone's just their minds are just so full of i don't know uncertainties and stuff like that but the yeah. body wants to dance and the body knows that it has to kind of you know uh has to dance and sort of you yeah. know stay grounded so to speak so this yeah. interconnectedness and why do you think as a dancer that's so important what is what is the kind of um, you know uh, like a shout out or a message that you'd like to give to young dancers um i think well when i like when i teach i feel like it's really a process of sharing like i don't feel like i'm teaching them because it's like you know we're we're discovering it ourselves right so i feel like i'm in the studio in the mornings figuring it out myself and then i like to share with them and i find that i see so much of myself in them you know i see them figuring it out and then seeing them figure it out helps me you know it feel it You're becomes so such a learning, right yeah yeah it's such yeah. a cycle and um and it's just really it's nice to see this the interest because there are there's you know there's kids they could be doing whatever they want right now with their time but the fact that like i've been teaching a zoom camp this whole month so the fact that they're spending 3 hours or 2 hours every day on dance means that they they love it 
right? And they want to give yeah. to it. And I hear everybody say, like, the first thing I ask them before we start camp is, you know, how often do you practice? How often do you want to practice? What keeps you from practicing? And everybody wants to practice, and nobody practices as much as they want to practice. Not, you know, yeah. so I think, like, at, this, at the most simple level, I think that if everybody could just practice, you know, I think that you would be so happy, you know, and, and it's hard. Like, yeah. I feel lucky that my mom drilled this work ethic into me at a young age because it's something that I could carry on and I'm trying to do that with Rumi too, you know, and, and it's like, and Kobe Bryant always says, you know, set these behaviors, they become behaviors, if you, they become habits, yeah. right, behavior yeah, patterns, absolutely. and so I think it's never too late to kind of create those behavior patterns for yourself, and I think just keep it simple, you know, like it's so hard, we tend to complicate things so much, but I think the best yeah. way to start is just do it, like I think that's like, such a good motto is to just do it, you know, and once you do it, you realize you can do it, and then you want to do it more, you know, and so even like, we don't, the level of analysis that we've given over the last hour, like, you don't need to do that on a daily basis, <laughs> just do it, and then, you know, you can yeah. figure the rest out. Yeah, uh, but, uh, but, but personally, Maitri, I, I think I took away a lot from this conversation, because mm -hmm. I really, um, I really like this whole idea that you talked about, that how when the body and the mind are in alignment, the mind yeah. is actually in a certain way, like like the space that you create yeah. in the mind. And I think yeah. that's so beautiful because um, I think that that's really what we're all in a sense aspiring for, right? To be yeah. in the moment, yeah. in the now. And and I also like the like the use of the word immersion, right? We're all yeah. kind of aspiring to be to immerse ourselves, right? Even if it's for a yeah. short while, just totally. to kind of you know. Uh, and yeah. intensity. I like that word as well. That's such a beautiful, yeah. uh, uh, you know, word. So thank you so much. Instagram thank is you. just uh, reminding me that the session is going to end. Thank you okay. so much for, uh, you. you know, sharing your insights with us. I really enjoyed it. And thank you to everybody who joined. This thank conversation you. will be available on IGTV. Thanks, Maithili. Thanks, Akila. Thanks for having me. Most welcome. See you Bye -bye. at Sanita's next. <laughs> Soon. Bye. Bye.